needed something to do between now and Mark's closing remarks, so I appreciate that. The, um, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're talking about, we're calling FastCat, and uh, let's see here. I'm, both my presentations this uh, weekend have been about patient reported outcome measures, which are very, very different from a CAT perspective. And as a CAT person, they're slightly depressing to me because the short fixed forms actually do an incredibly good job when you use rating scale items. But uh, again, they, these things provide symptoms. They're being used in hospitals increasingly. And you can take a health CAT in about an average of 50 seconds, the whole CAT. Um, because you're talking about it takes a person on average about 10 seconds to answer an item and we, we've gotten our median times you're going to see in a little bit has been about seven items max of 12. Uh, so what that's led to is in terms of assessing people's health we're tipping, typically recommending people are giving five cats in a row and it taking under five minutes. So if we could save a little time we could give another few cats or it could even take less time. So, I mean, I know when you're talking about educational testing or high stakes testing, you know, we're all worried about time, but it's a completely different scale that we're talking about. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about this group, about classical, et cetera. So the patient report outcomes measurement information system uh, is a uh, initiative by National Institutes of Health. It's about 12 years old at this point. Um, it uh, was, to the RFP from the federal government and the U.S. National Institutes of Health was to create item banks and a system to administer them, which at the time was incredibly unique in outcome measurement um, and obviously not so unique in educational assessment. Um, so people, uh, we'll skip here. I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the audience here. We don't need to do this. Okay, so the difference of the PRO item bank is we've got a construct, in this case we're going to take physical functioning, um, and you've got at the far right end of the screen somebody who's bed bound or injured, at the left side of the screen somebody who is a, a sports figure. And as in all item banks, of course, you want to get items across the trait range. It's, it ends up being incredibly difficult, my previous talk was, to get any items above about the midpoint. The concept of physical functioning traditionally was to get a person to the ability to walk around the block, which is about the 45th percentile. But that's the time when a hospital wants you discharged or the, physical, the insurance company wants to stop paying for uh, uh, physical therapy. But the reality is if you're a person with, I believe, the health of anyone in this room, let alone a person who plays tennis on the weekends, you want your health to be brought up further. So there are all issues with ceiling and uh, floor effects, which are, um, are going to be a little bit important for what we're talking about. So, hello. Okay. So current promise stopping rules. So this, <laughs> the, the methodology followed by promise was they had a psychometric group of about 20 psychometricians from all over the place. I would say David Thyssen had a disproportionate amount of influence in the room. Uh, because it was his student, Bryce Reeve, who d put out the original uh, RFA. But when all said and done, um, the decision was to start the CAT at the uh, mean of the U.S. general population, okay, which again is pretty close to a ceiling for a person who's clinically there but uh, got people to where they needed to be soon enough. A minimum of four items, there's a lot of discussion in the literature as to how many items you have to ask a person before they start being honest. Um, and, and a lot of people don't believe that a single item does the trick. So if I ask you if you have pain, you might say absolutely no, but if I ask you another time, you might start admitting you have that. Uh, stopping with a T-score macro, three-tenths of a standard error, and a maximum of 12 items. This all sounded incredibly reasonable in practice, and obviously compared to educational testing, wow, you can get done in 12 items, wonderful, get down to three-tenths of standard error. Again, if you're not familiar with polytomous items, they have phenomenal power. And unfortunately, I think most attempts to apply polytomous cat to ability items have failed. You just can't, <laughs> you got the right answer, everything else is wrong. Trying to glean a little bit of extra information doesn't work. Um, this works well in most contexts. Um, uh, as the standard error is quickly uh, reached. But the problem is ceiling and floor effects um, and the impact of burden. 
So on one hand, we're thinking five minutes to take five cats, that's unbelievable. Actually, the earlier presentation was in today, there was a language barrier. He was attempting to tell people that everyone was able to take the entire cat in 23 uh, one hundredths of a second. Uh, he meant the calculation time. Uh, but uh, you know, these are very, very um, short, short banks. But when a, a bank fails to cover the full range of the trait, we lose either way. So if there's a not enough people towards the ceiling, then uh, A, we don't do accurate measurement. But the other problem is, is that the cat doesn't stop, right? So if I ask three times in a row, and this is fairly typical, do you have pain this way or that way? They say never. So, and the next item is never, and the next item is never. And for those of you who've ever tried to calculate standard error, when you have all zeros or all ones, that standard error is, it's really infinity, but you know, we, all, we can use Bayesian to say it's not really infinity, it's less. Either way, you're not gonna have a cutoff. Um, and so what's happening, well, the reason this research originally started is that uh, there are people doing what's called ecological momentary assessment, EMA, and they're having a person's cell phone ping them at random times during the day and asking them how much is their pain interfering with their daily activities. And so, of course, it's now 10 a.m. and I had my surgery two weeks ago and I have no pain and says, has your pain interfered with your ability to do errands today? Not at all. Has it interfered with your ability to do your job? Not at all. And I'm gonna answer that 12 times and that was kind of aggravating because all I had to do was answer once and you know we're done. I don't have pain. Bing, 2 p.m. Has your pain interfered in your ability to do blank? Again, it's gonna, because it's at the floor, the standard error is not reducing. And those people were always getting 12 items. And if we gave them five cats and they really had no clinical issue, they're getting 60 items because we had a ceiling of 12, which sounds pretty short. It became very irksome for people. Um, uh, the same happened at the ceiling. You had a person who is very healthy physically or, very, or even uh, you know, somebody preoperatively having something on but, or they, but that component of their health is fine. I say, I have no trouble running, what's a, uh, a depression item, uh, or fatigue. You know, are you too tired to run errands? Never, I'm fine. Are you too tired to do this? Are you too tired of that? The other thing is, is that you begin, somebody gave one of the symposia, once you get up there, after three or four items, I'm asking easier things. I'm not actually asking something hard to do. I'm asking, are you too tired to, you know, uh, get out of bed? Well, I already told you, I'm not too tired to run an errand because the bank is sealing out. Again, we're getting these 12 items. So um, we're gonna talk about the pain interference bank in particular. It ends up being incredibly accurate way of assessing people's pain. The typical way pains assess the United States is by a faces scale. It's in every single emergency room in the United States. They point it and say, what, is your, what does your pain look like the most on a scale of zero to 10? Um, people make treatment decisions based on it. When it was IRT analyzed by people in my group, we discovered there's absolutely no differentiation between three and seven, and yet people get uh, uh, pain relief between three and four, and five or six, they take them off of it. It's, it's a crazy setup, but uh, they're stuck on it. So this came up, um, has items on it. How much did pain interfere with your enjoyment of life, to your, your ability to do household chores, getting into a standing position, sitting for more than an hour, et cetera. So uh, the bank is 40 items. It's also available in short form versions. Uh, obviously, you know, IRT pattern-based scoring or uh, maximum likelihood scoring. So again, no pain makes a very long test. Um, I have no pain, I still have no pain, no pain, pain didn't bother me today, et cetera. It's actually a big problem. So we thought, could we develop a new set of starting, stopping rules? There are people here in the room that know uh, Sung Choi, uh, now with ACT or with Pacific Metro and ACT, he had come up with some pretty novel, when he was working with um, me, he had come up with some pretty novel ways to do this, but in, in, in the end it didn't, reduce the burden uh, sufficiently. So what do we do? We're looking at both ends of scale. How do we get rid of this overburden for people with high functioning, low functioning, and uh, can we apply secondary uh, stopping rules, and will the scores that result uh, strongly correlate with the scores had they taken a longer assessment? So there was a 
back in pain depression study, we had 400 subjects. They took 11 cats. And again, remember, that's probably 11 minutes uh, at the most. Um, and we stopped minimum of four items, standard error, less than three, or when 12 items had been administered. Again, a ceiling and floor, you're never going to get the, the standard error uh, starting rule. Um, we create this omnibus data set of um, 12,000 different cats that people had taken over this study over time. And we knew the number of items they were taking, whether or not a cat stopping rule had been invoked. Um, we had their provisional store, score estimates after every item and their final, actually their final score and standard error. Uh, then we disaggregated this and started looking at, um, we, we limited to eight of the 11 banks. Three of them are pretty much short forms or there are very few items in the bank. And again, focused on pain interference. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so when we're done, we were looking at and we're able to prove, so looking at the right-hand co column, first, we could not start, start at the mean of the general population. Once, once we did the full range of the trait, we had to start a little bit higher or the CAD algorithm wouldn't ratchet itself up fast enough to get the level of reliability um, for people who might be higher. We did switch it to a minimum of two items. Um, one should do it, but clinicians didn't want to use it. And frankly, you can do anything you want psychometrically, but if the end users don't want it the way the math says it'll work, uh, we give in to the client, so we did. Um, what we, we st the first new stopping rule we had is a two item screen. If a person ended in the extreme category after two items, either low or high, we cut off the test. So if they said two times in a row, pain didn't bother me at all today, and pain really didn't bother me at all today, it's, um, we stopped. Or if they said um, pain uh, interrupted everything I did all day long, and then we asked them the next, was pain interfere with regular daily activities, whatever. We realize that this person is so off the extremes, we simply don't have items that can differentiate a person at either of those extremes. We kept the 0.3 standard error cutoff. Um, we did, we, we operation what we call the standard error stability rule. And that is that in certain places in the trait range, and the standard error is not going to reduce by giving more items. There's just no more information to be gained. The, the person's, uh, the items are a mismatch. Uh, they're not at the extreme, but you still don't have anything left to give. And rather than keeping shooting items at a person that's not increasing information, we cut off when the standard error was going to reduce less than 0.1. And also, we switched the maximum to seven items, and I'll show you how we got there in a minute. So uh, these, all these new rules are called CAT-ALT. Uh, we applied it post hoc to the secondary data set. So all of those rules are a subset of the original rules. So we could take the original CATs and see if we apply new sets of rules to that if we would indeed have a shorter test. Um, so let's go. OK, let's see if the animation works. So what you've got here is on, on the left side is a number of items administered. And on the right side is with the original CAT algorithm. On the right side is the alternative. Um, I'm sorry. I hate these things. OK, good enough. Two item test on the original formula, nobody had that, right? Because our minimum was four. And you could see right off the top that 72.5% of the population on pain interference relative to this sample stopped at the minimum number items of four. That is using a standard error cutoff. Because remember, in these domains of um, patient reported outcomes, many of these domains aren't relevant to the given patient. So that's not surprising. But when we switched it to a minimum of two, 48% of the people. Cut, um, well, with all the rules together, stopped and cut off. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. So 72.5% stopped after four items. With minimum removed, 85.6% stopped after four items. And obviously, 48%, close to 48% of them had stopped after two. Um, mean and binders administered reduced so that you could see under the seven, these are the new rules without the ceiling. Without the ceiling, there's only 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Less than 1% of the people assessed uh, would have gone on beyond seven items anyway. Um, so we cut that back. We saw that the uh, 
by stopping rule, what the change was, the two item screener saved us 12 and a half percent of the population. The standard error less than three rule less because it's taken up in there. Standard error change rule, 5% of the people. Thank you. Um, and then the, the 12 items administered 7.4% in the original sample with the alternate rules, 0.1. Again, in the end, we actually cut the maximum number of items down to seven. Never reach. And, and that's another good point. 7.4% of the people never reach the standard error cutoff simply because, again, if you're extreme or the bank is not deep enough, and there are only so many ways you can ask a person if they're in pain, and there's only so many ways you can ask a person if they're fatigued. There's, we are not generating, no amount of automated item generation or team sitting down can do it. This is, is just, and we're always circling around the construct, right? There's not something we can plug in. You know, stress is a good one. Maybe they now have a biomarker for stress. You can take cortisol readings and saliva. But other than that, you can only ask, is a person stressed in this situation versus that? And there are only so many situations that don't become overlapping. Um, so interesting, when we're all said and done, the correlation between the scores was 0.98. Um, and, and then if it, actually if you reduce, if you get rid of the ones that never reach a standard stopping order, uh, we even did a little bit better than that. Um, so can't length, I'm not sure. It's going to be better to read in the paper versus uh, seeing up here. But um, first of all, you can see total numbers of items using the cat alt ranged um, quite a bit. So what, the goal of this slide is to say what was the amount of effort that was saved in total by people using these alternate stopping rules. Um, so you can see decrease in response burden ranged from 16.4% in our sleep bank to 61% in pain interference. And again, that makes sense. The pain interference is if you have no pain, you were previously taking a 12 item test and now you're taking a two item test. Or, and most of it was the case. Uh, sleep impairment, almost anybody who came from out of the country here would admit to some level of sleep impairment right now. Um, it's, not a, it's not a domain that people tend to be at the extremes. 90% um, of pain interference now ended before the four item cutoff and 12 item cats were extremely rare. Uh, average number of items administered ranged from 2.1 in pain interference to 5.3 in an anger bank. And again, the, that's why we started cutting off much earlier. So the average uh, for the original ranged from 4.2 to 6.5. So that's even with the maximum of 12. Okay. Um, so, these are individual examples in the interest of it being Monday afternoon. Am I going the wrong way? Oh, this is just uh, the examples of this is pain interference again, 90% ended prior to four items. 90% of physical function cats ended before five items were administered. Also, that now that's pro that's the most widely used promise bank. It was given several million times last year in major hospitals. People want to assess physical functioning before or after surgery. Um, and again, even depression, fatigue, satisfaction with social roles, activities, and before items were administered. Um, these end up being incredibly important clinical things to know. A person who has depression, uh, whatever treatment you give them, they're not going to feel good about it. So they tell you that they don't, even though their physical functions improved, they say they didn't. Some use fatigued. It's a... Uh, it's an um, area of variance of trying to figure out why a person's treatment needs to change. Satisfaction with social roles and activities. It turns out, for instance, if you have a senior citizen uh, who had great surgeries discharged, if they don't have satisfactory social activities, they have a, like a 90% chance of showing back up in the emergency room the next day because they have no one at home to take care of them. And we can figure that out by giving a 50 second, now 35 second cat and save the way U.S. healthcare is working, we're actually now paying only once. The government's switching to a system where you only pay once uh, for a patient. So if they keep coming back, it's on that first payment. It's a lot better not to send them home if you know they're going to show up the next day anyway. Okay, so um, our, our next concern. Well, which is ninety percent? I'm sorry, I cannot see my local slides here. Fifteen minutes occurring. Night head lengths. So originally, our cats tended to be four, five, or seven items long, and then they went to two, three, or four. 
uh, in this pain interference sample. Um, and then again, it has to be, then we looked at was it, how much is it important for the clinical relevant domain for that individual patient. So um, for pain interference, um, again, uh, stopping when invoked under both original and alternate set of stopping rules, the two item was 21% on the pain interference, standard error, um, less than three, cut called 77%. This little SE change, less than 0.10, it's a small percent, but it's pretty important. We are really wasting time on giving people tests where the item bank simply has no more items left that's going to, that are going to be important. Now, um, on our pain interference sample, originally we gave a total of 2,048 items to these 499 people. After we're done, we only gave 1,090. So we had close to a 50% reduction in burden, okay? And so with no loss in reliability, uh, we were able to cut the length 50%, you know, we're all busy usually trying to, can we, can we tweak our CAD algorithms to save an item or two? And, and in this particular, and our best, this is the best, we get the best bang for the buck in pain interference. Um, sleep inter uh, depression saved 1,000 items in this group, sleep impairment 1,600 items. In any case, huge. Um, so you can see the number of items range again 2.2 on average for pain interference, 5.3 in anger, and the original it was physical functioning and sleep impairment where the majority of the length was contained. So uh, our results are, we, we you know, are no longer need our form, mini form item minimum. We can cut that down quite a bit. Um, we can look, at, we can get our, stand our standard stopping rule. We don't have to worry about the 12 items. Um, and with the alternate rules, z literally 0% of the cats needed the 12 items anyway. Um, this, now this is a discussion of how we decided what to set the maximum at. Um, and we could see that, again, most of them have ended much, much earlier. Uh, at five items, 40% of anger were still being assessed, 12% of sleep impairment, 5% depression, 3% anger, six items. Um, we had covered 100% of these banks. We still had a little bit left here. After seven items, we only had one-tenth of 1% 1 of people taking anxiety left to be assessed better, three-tenths of 1% of depression, 3% of sleep impairment, 4.3% of anger had not ended. That doesn't mean we were going to get a significantly better score on these people, mind you, but we could have gotten better measurement there. In theory, we could have different ending criteria or different maximum test lengths for each of these banks. Um, I think I made the point at lunch or something the other day. I, I believe CAD is still very, very difficult to explain to people. Um, I think everyone in the room, we do it all the time. Um, having a fixed set of stopping rules, particularly when we, ha we have 80 banks that people are using, telling them we had 80 different stopping rules is just beyond uh, the comprehension of the average clinician who we've just figured out how to convince them to use a CAT in the first place. Um, on a correlation basis, the scores correlated 99 for anger, 98 for sleep, the original rules to the alternate rules, mean difference between scores, uh, lost one-tenth of on a T-score metric, okay? So one-tenth of a, what is that, one one-hundredth of a standard deviation for anger and up to 1.16. So, uh, uh, is that 0.116 of a standard, uh, Era, standard deviation for sleep impairment. Um, and they, uh, those are the T-score metric here, the standard errors. Uh, all told then, we had original study used um, number of cats administered the same, ranges changed quite a bit, but we went from administering a total of 64,000 items to 38,000 items, the overall 40% reduction. Uh, again, people will either use that to give shorter tests or they'll use it to sneak in an extra domain or two. Whoops. Um, we, the, the new algorithm continues to adapt to the person. Uh, we can adapt it for a given measurement uh, context. We can use alternate rules. Um, we do find, you know, we did find there's substantially different measure, uh, measurement experiences both across and within measures depending on what the construct is and what the, how that construct is relevant to the individual patient. And again, as opposed to people who are giving a math test to people in a math class, these are all domains that are very relevant to, the, to treatment, but they may not be as relevant to that patient on that given day or on that given hour. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll leave a few minutes for questions, so I think we have quite a bit of time because the second speaker didn't make it. 
but uh, I open the floor to questions. Yes, Mark. Uh, I'm always better. <laughs> I got two questions. And I appreciate that, so. Uh, one is, well, first of all, I find this absolutely intriguing. It's something that I've you know, not really been aware of that much. And, uh, and I've been, uh, I don't know if these are questions or comments, but uh, one comment is that uh, this is very interesting because it's an unusual scale that you're working with in the sense of that it seems, at least for the pain part of this, I don't know about the rest of them, that it has a true zero point. And that you're trying to differentiate people from the zero. And so I'm assuming that the, 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 the distribution for a, a non-clinical population of this is going to be very skewed distribution. Absolutely. And, uh, and so you've got to deal with that problem as part of the way that you do you know, deal with this, this kind of instrument. So that, I'm trying to just process that in my own head about uh, how I would do that. But the other part of that is, I, I do you know, challenge a little bit the thing that you said about the item development. Because I was trying to think about this, let's say, you know, for the pain, let's say the first question was something like, have you experienced any pain at all of any type during the last week? Okay, and you know this is sort of like what they do on the lie scales of the MMPI and stuff. When you go over and have you know questions where you know practically everybody would have to go over and answer or, or respond to if they're being honest. And then you know, and then another question might be, have you experienced any kind of pain whatsoever during the during the last day? Now, then your, your important things are you're trying to get at, well, does it interfere with behavior? You know, the, the, the next part is, okay, if, you, if you've already admitted you've experienced pain, then the question is, does that pain that you've experienced does it interfere with your activities whatsoever? And that's, you know, then if you've already got some responses to indicate whether or not they say no to the first two questions, I have not experienced any pain over the last week and any pain over the last day, then I, you know, they're almost wide to ask any more questions. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately they do. I mean, that's the problem with pain, uh, particularly as people get older. Um, last week, no, I had no pain. No, no. Did pain interfere with your ability to blank? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, now, by the way, Promise itself has measures just attempting to assess level of pain. Um, they're there, but unfortunately it is not a complete it's not clean. You know, the way we view our health or what we're doing, it's the reason why the clinicians won't let us ask one item. Because it turns out there's, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, a, it, it's more than zero. Of people, if you ask them twice, the extreme, they'll say, oh yeah, okay, you got me. And the thing is, we don't account for cheating. It's been, I've, I've been grinning every time somebody talks about exposure issues, things like that. We don't, nobody pays any attention to exposure in these items. It's a little bit of a problem. I've done some work with the Department of Defense, and they have, the, they have one of two problems when they assess pain. One is that people who are in pain say they don't have it, so they can get back on duty as soon as possible. And they figure if they say they don't have pain, and we're actually working with them on examining standard error and differentiation of how people, people say, you know, they're trying to game it. Um, and it turns out if you let somebody go back too quickly, they actually will hurt themselves. And then you have the people who want as much pain as they can have because that opioid crisis in the United States and around the world is based on people getting pain medications. So um, we have people trying to game all the time. And as with any clinical symptom, you know, you, you shouldn't base anything on one test. Uh, but people do, they, they lie on purpose or they lie inadvertently. So yes, I, unfortunately there would absolutely be people who say, I didn't have pain all week and I didn't have pain the last 24 hours. Did pain, somebody with rheumatoid arthritis though, in proportion, did it impact your ability to do something? Absolutely. And you'll just say, wait, I just told you, you're not a lawyer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So the one, so uh, the other session I did had for physical functioning in particular, we were only capturing, we 
we're capturing less than 60% of the population. And realistically, I'd argue the items are really only accurate to about the 50th percentile, which is traditionally what you'd be assessing. Um, the adaptive rule that we need to change is starting number that even with polytomous items, we weren't uh, able to get all the way there. I think that's okay, except there's no other speaker, so you can cut me off, but there's no one here to take the second half of the session. Um, uh, uh, we'll try again, we'll do more. I don't think they'll change rapidly. You know, people don't want these measures to change. They're, there's a big movement not to re-norm in a few years because it's just so big and won't mean with the old scores. Um, I, that's not the way I look at things, but I try to put on more of a neuropsych hat sometimes than a, the, you know, a clinical hat. And people like using clinical measures that they learned in school, you know, and, and they very rarely want to change. This is, I didn't point this out here, but um, there are forces in the United States that are making it necessary to give outcome measures to patients. You can no longer get a drug approved without it imp improving quality of life. You can no longer get reimbursement from most insurance companies, certainly from Medicare, without a patient reporting a benefit, not an x-ray showing they're better. And this is, this is very typical in orthopedic surgery. X-ray shows perfect surgery, perfect healing. The patient says, I'm still in pain or I can't do something. You're not gonna get reimbursed pretty soon. So this has become really important and it's just literally exploded starting last year. This project's over a decade old, but somebody like uh, University of Rochester last year gave a million cats. Uh, you know, that's one hospital and they just started and Utah gave 500,000 cats. And as of next year, I'm gonna guess what I can track will be 100 or 200 million. We're not, we don't track them. We, we, we used to offer this cloud as service, but it's, when you get to those kinds of numbers, we realize it was just silly to f have it go through one place. And since there's no profit motive here whatsoever, you know, we it literally push the algorithms to local installations. Um, so it hopefully will allow more research on the cat side of this to go to find out where we can do it. You know, Sung tried to reduce length by finding two constructs in the same item. The problem, so he was able to take depression and separate out anxiety. So instead of giving a maximum of 12, you could give eight, uh, 18 items and get both. The problem is we can knock this down now to an average of three or four. So, and then trying to explain to people that while we've been preaching unidimensionality forever, but indeed we can pull a second dimension out of there, another uh, difficult thing to do. Apparently the second speaker didn't make it, so um, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>